We are here in Winter Park. Shout out to everyone joining us. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us today. Uh, we have Nate Zerker uh, here with us. Uh, Nate and I have known each other for nine years, and he has been on a journey, s same with me, uh, all over the place. Uh, Nate was in a band and is still in a band uh, called Judah and the Lion. Uh, he has um, His roles have kind of changed throughout that, but he's always kind of been there uh, doing the uh, just playing, writing, doing all the things, and he plays the banjo. And so he's been in industry, Judah and the Lion, all the cool things, uh, music. So we're going to talk all things music. We're going to talk come up. We're going to talk about making decisions, how we roll, and then the future because your future is crazy. And so uh, we've been talking about that a little bit on the phone the other day. I'm, s I'm so excited to be sitting with you and just to be reconnecting, to be honest. This is so refreshing for me. And to see you in this space, to see you in Winter Park, Colorado, uh, man, I'm just so excited to see you. You look good, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. You look. Yeah. You look great. You always have. You always have the beard. I, sometimes I don't, and that's a, it's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so working on keeping it. Uh, um, are you 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 love you love skiing? You excited about the the time that's coming? I do. Yeah. Uh, first big storm is supposed to hit this weekend. Um, so hoping it's a really snowy beautiful winter and uh yeah that's definitely a big part of why i chose to live up here and something i grew up doing and loving so really grateful that i get to have a space and a home and community that's uh not totally prioritized around that but it's a large part of why people choose to be here and so i kind of look at it similarly to when i moved to nashville and wanted to be around the music culture and prioritizing that more um, which is helpful to be around other folks that understand and are also kind of working towards similar goals. So this has been a really special place for that. But um, it's been a journey to figure this out. But yeah, over the last couple of years to see what it looks like to get back into music and after COVID and yeah, transitioning with my role with the band. And um, so it kind of feels like we've got a, a good balance right now, just trying to figure out how to appreciate it and uh, understand what it means and, and all that. So, but I love it up here. It's been really good. Oh, that's so good. Also, Really good to see you. <laughs> I appreciate so, thanks it. Thanks for wanting to do this. So. Oh man, I appreciate it, man. I've I've been looking forward to we we you know we scheduled this a little bit ago, and uh, I just been looking forward to. Uh, I just feel like there's so many different things that you've experienced in life that will be phenomenal to hear and learn from, but then also just to share with people, um, because I mean the music industry, you know, you've got behind you, you've got records, you know, the one on. Uh, you know, folk hop and roll. I uh, hope I said that correctly. Folk hop and roll Correct. with the with you guys. You know, your outer space, whatever. And you know that says you know uh, over a million copies sold, and then uh, suit and jacket over half a million sold. So it's like these two records that are over you are like, you know, people see that and they're like, oh, you've got it made. You know, and yes, on in some hand you've made it in the music world, but in others you're still in process, and what have you learned from that? So, like, I just, I just think you have s you're just a gold mine, really, of like experience and information and wealth because, and wealth and knowledge, you know, and like, I remember you were, you guys were about to go on tour when we first met with Twenty One Pilots, and you're going to open for them, and I just remember. Like you were on these late night talk shows, you were you guys were on Jimmy Fallon. Uh, you remember that? that yep. You've yep. been a few times, right? Uh, actually, I haven't done Fallon, but we've done Kimmel. And That's Conan what it was. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. It I was. I just remember you being on a few different late night shows, yeah. uh, which was so cool. Uh, take me back to what you just said a second ago. Surrounding yourself with the people that had th similar goals aspirations and could help you get to where you wanted to be because that's why you really moved to Nashville but I've seen you do that a few different times in life or I, I imagine that that's what you, what you learned then is what you've kept applying based off of the the re-envisioned future that you've had so can you take us to why you moved to Nashville in the first place and when was it and what was Nate like and maybe even what was Nate looking for in life yeah so uh 
I moved to Nashville in 2010, uh, studied guitar at Belmont University, and I grew up in a musical family. Both my parents are in the symphony in Colorado Springs. Mm. Um, so just basically since I can remember was playing something, uh, I would say that I really fell in love with the idea of being in a band and making that happen in sixth grade. I saw School of Rock. Uh, yes, like you did see School of Rock. Those kids are my age. This feels... Um, it was just one of those moments of, don't totally know how to explain it, but it's like, I'm so inspired, I have to do that. I found a path to follow. Um, my uh, sister's boyfriend at the time also was in a band. Uh, they were like five years older than me, and so he was getting ready to go to school himself. Was an incredible, still is an incredible guitar player. We keep up a little bit, but... Uh, he gave me a live record of Incubus, like the DVD thing, and uh, just that was on constantly. And I think it was just it being f in Colorado, um, I'd already loved their music a bit, but like really started to nerd out and see like I want to do that. That's that's the path. Um, so I started writing and playing as much as I possibly could. After that, um, towards the end of high school, I had my own band, and we were playing all over Colorado and. You know, trying to do the grassroots thing, um, just trying to make it happen. And uh, Nashville, I would say in addition to Boston, was where I would kind of thought I would have gone just because they have such an incredible music school up at Berkeley. Um, but Nashville made more sense financially. is closer to home. I was also more into folk music, so that was kind of the, the play to go there. But, uh, yeah, I got to town in 2010. Um, just went for it, uh, trying to, you know, it was good to go to school, and I think largely to like, have something else to work on uh, while things, you know, were coming together or weren't working out. It's not that like I got there and everything just happened right away. Um, I didn't meet the Judah guys until about a year and a half later. Um, but yeah, I again had that kind of idea of what I wanted to do. At that time, I had just gotten a banjo as a like graduation gift. Um, one of my buddies had one laying around. He's like, "You'll probably use this. No one in our family is touching it." you're going to Nashville I was like sure I'll take it um, and that summer Mumford and Sons their Cy No More record had just come out and I'd been listening to banjo for a while but every time I'd heard it, it just was kind of one of those at, I guess I still feel this way <laughs> uh, but I'm often like what is that guy doing like I don't understand what's going on um, as opposed to a lot of other instruments it's not that I can just go play those things but like in my brain it just makes a little bit more sense um, but when I heard Mumford and Winston playing, it was just like, it clicked. I was like, I think I can do that. Um, so I started working on learning some of their songs and it just got more fun. I uh, started having an understanding of it to where it wasn't just like this thing I had in the corner that I could, you know, like any guitar player can find their way around and hundreds of guitar me study. At Bell okay. So we need to take a quick break. Uh, let's pick back up where you were talking about when you heard Mumford and Sons. So what did you feel when you heard that? Because you were dabbling a little bit with the banjo. Uh, I'm not really sure. And then it was just like a side thing. You heard Mumford and Sons flipped the script. And then that hit a trajectory that you were unexpecting. And that was unexpected. And you were like, whoa, hold on now. Maybe I could do this. So take us from there. And then what are the things that happened to get us to the point of, of really that first tour? Yeah. So 2010, uh, Mumford's Sign No More record came out. And I'd heard banjo, you know, played at different points. Like I remember, I think I was in fifth grade. I was at my buddy's house and we watched a Bela Fleck concert. And uh, his song, Big Country, was super influential, thought it was beautiful. But um, really, just I looked at that instrument as like, that is one of the hardest things you could probably learn. Um, I feel like a lot of times I can listen to things, and it's not that I can go just play them by any means, but they compute in my head a little more. I can understand what's happening. And it's all to say, hearing Mumford, that record, and Winston's banjo playing, um, that was the first time I was like, I think I can do that. It kind of makes sense to me. Um, so, yeah, I picked up my banjo more, started 
kind of messing around and um in school it was my elective kind of class instrument or whatever but was studying guitar and um yeah I just kind of went on throughout that freshman year playing guitar working really hard at that but uh, I didn't feel like I had any way to really stand out. There's so many people in town that could play so well at the school with hundreds of guitar majors. Just had a really hard time kind of finding my my way, I guess. Um, and yeah, I, you know, had a great church that I was involved at. Uh, they really poured into me and helped out with a lot of aspects of my life that I think were really important too. But um, they had a team of people that incredible worship leaders musicians and just a great hang and so i was like what does it look like to maybe get more involved and the banjo ended up kind of being the in on the worship team um i had ended up switching my major from guitar to banjo performance that sophomore year after just being pretty discouraged again through not really having my my way to stand out um, and that was a really important you know decision to do that I had talked about potentially transferring moving to Montana State to study snow science uh, and just kind of total 180 from um, what I was going for and what I believed was kind of my my calling but it was also you know adjacent to some of the other things that I love and grew up in the mountains and playing in them and so um, but yeah I, I just had felt like there's so much purpose and intention behind all these things to get to this point in Nashville that it was really discouraging to think about kind of giving up on it. It's what it felt like. And uh, so my banjo teacher, you know, made some calls and said, hey, if you want this, we can switch you over to a banjo major. Um, so we did that. And I was the first one or the only one at the school at the time. Uh, there had been one before me, but a while back. And so it just it wasn't advertised, didn't know it was an option. Um, had never really imagined that this would become my priority. But uh yeah, made that switch and kind of the floodgates just started opening. Um yeah, I got to start playing at church more. Uh, I met Brian, our mandolin player in Judah, and we were both doing like folk worship stuff at the church. Judah heard about that. He was wanting to make kind of more folk style worship music. And so the three of us linked up in December of that year, 2011, and um, it just, yeah, it clicked. Like, we went to lunch, hung out at the Bell Tower, played some music, and it just really felt super special. Um, one of the most kind of obvious moments in my life of, you need to pay attention to this. Uh, you know, obviously can't know what it'll look like, but for me, who I'd not moved to Nashville to go to school to get a degree, um, those things would be great, but it was more like I want to find people to play with. What's the next step on this journey of becoming a professional musician? Um, and just having time with those guys, it was so apparent that there was something at least special to pay attention to. So, yeah, we ended up recording a record that February. And for both of them, I think it was more of like a one-off kind of deal. They weren't necessarily thinking exactly like I was about it um, not that they weren't interested but uh, I started to kind of chip away at them to see if maybe down to try doing some more recordings writing play some shows um, by that summer they'd kind of agreed to you know give it a real go anyway and so we started playing around town a little bit and Belmont had these showcases where you know, a few thousand people would show up every time. It's kind of required for some of the music students, but it was also sort of like a talent hub where industry people would come and check people out. And so that really was kind of the a big door that we were given um, to get to be in front of all these people, put a lot of work into a big production and um, make a statement, I guess. And so things started to really kind of it's not like they took off. It's not like we were playing in front of that many people right away from there, but um, we really start to got, get some belief from those things. We got a manager also at Belmont who, you know, we were his first band, but kind of that go-getter attitude of everyone figuring it out and 
he's a great asset to our team. And from there, started to, you know, play house shows around town, get some more gigs. We went on a house show tour. And, uh, yeah, it just, things were happening, and it was really exciting. Um, so that come the next winter, you know, I was halfway th- through my junior year. Uh, I was kind of at a breaking point when I got home for Christmas break. Uh, I was taking, like, 20 credit hours. We were doing shows Thursday through Sunday all around the southeast region. We'd, you know, go out for the weekend and come home and dive into work, classes, all the things I was trying to date. I just had too much going on. So it was definitely at this breaking point where I got home and was really confused and kind of in that discouraged space again of what do I do? It doesn't seem like this is sustainable. Can this actually happen? Um, And my dad and some other folks really came around me and helped me appreciate kind of what was happening, how special this opportunity may actually be. And the biggest advice I got from my dad, which, you know, was the last thing I expected, but it was essentially like, hey, you can go back to school if that's right later on, but I don't know if you're going to get another opportunity like this. So basically encouraging me to drop out of school and really go for the band. So took that advice and, um, yeah, got back to school. Uh, I think it was like January 4th. And uh, everyone was going to class, and I was walking out of the office having just given my whatever, not resignation, but... Uh, Dropout papers I'm out. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll so. catch you guys later. Don't charge me anymore. Yeah, That's exactly. The paperwork, yeah. the paperwork yeah. is, I'm not here. <laughs> Don't expect me. Right. So that was an amazing feeling, um, and just confirmation to have people supporting that, too. Like, I, w- I would have never felt like I had a team of people behind me kind of encouraging me to take that step but and also that it wasn't so final you know it's like you got this opportunity let's clear out some space so you can be more present in it and then if we need to bring things back in or shift it around you can but this feels like the thing for you now and so yeah it opened up a lot of time space in my head and just uh also kind of gave that fire of like all right (laughs) We're doing it. Like, who knows what it's going to actually look like, but um, I got to really continue to pour into this and work on it and invest in it. And, uh, yeah, it took about another year before the rest of the guys either graduated or also dropped out. Um, And then we started going full-time out on the road in 2014. And um, it's kind of been nonstop since, obviously, some things with COVID and other life things have happened. But... That was it's really the point where like we're gonna actually all jump in, go for it, see what happens, and um, thankful that we did. Man, and and now you're and you're getting ready to go on tour in a week or so um, for the next few months. I'm excited to see you guys when you come to Denver. Um, your story, just even that, right? That point, and it's just it's only been ten years. In some ways, that feels like a long time since 2014 when you went full force into that. And in other ways, it feels like, whoa, that's not that long at all. There's m- many more decades left to live. And it's like, whoa, that was just one? I think people uh, I think people regularly, myself included, we overestimate what can happen in a year, and we underestimate what can happen in 10. And the thing that you do... One of the things that you do that I hear over and over and over again is you see an opportunity and you go all in, which is also a trait that is very rare for for many people, myself included sometimes. It's really hard to go all in. What, What makes an opportunity worth going all in for? Like what is that? What is that opportunity? Bell tower, feeling, thinking. What does that look like? How do you feel? I think, you know, going through all of this and kind of catching back up on the story and I'm noticing a lot of parallels to where I am now. It's like I'm excited to be processing this as we're talking, you know, going back and listening, um, being able to be more present in our conversation in a different way than 
you know, being right here. But I think not to like <laughs> build us up too much, but I think there's some wisdom here for even for us uh, to be able to, you know, go back and 100 percent here. So um, I can't wait to reflect. Yeah, exactly. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Ah, oh, you're so welcome. Thank uh, you. Yeah, for sure. Oh, gosh. Um, but thinking of that particular moment of clarity, you know, not knowing what it would look like and how it would all go, but such an obvious, like, you know, pay attention here kind of thing. I'm not sure I've had another that was that clear. I think there have been things in my life that I've really wanted, uh, things I thought were good and worthy of my time. And not that they weren't, but I'm not sure that I have such a good gauge or have had any thing as obvious as that as to like hey you really and I guess that discredits you know what we learn and again obviously in hindsight like I can look at oh that that relationship didn't work out so it's easy to be like that wasn't a good Mm -hmm. investment of time but it's part of our story and or this other job opportunity or even within the band of like this tour or this thing or will be a bigger deal than it ended up being or vice versa. And so it's good, I think, to have moments like that where it's like, okay, I really believe in this and I'm going to go for it. But I also, you know, just as I've gotten older, I've learned there's more to life than (laughs) just that one thing. It affects more than I could have ever imagined. You know, I'm not sitting there as a 20-year-old when we started the band thinking like, oh, this is going to affect hundreds of people that we end up working with throughout our career. We're going to have to be responsible for (laughs) running a business. We're going to be in front of all these people or not as many people as I would have thought, or just like you can't. And I think there's good things to learn from that of like, you know, we can't control and know how everything's going to look. And so we can't just get paralyzed and do nothing. You have to take those risks and thank God that there was that moment of clarity, but I think now I'm trying to really figure out what it looks like to have a balance and not go so all in on one thing. Because that's what I'll Mm. lean towards, you know. I was in a long-distance relationship recently, and I was like, I'm willing to (laughs) move. I'm willing to give up X, Y, and Z to make this work because I believe that it's worth it to be with this person. And I think things like that, you know, can make me lose my own agency and what makes me tick in order to give up whatever for that thing or whether it's a new venture or something I'm excited about. Even making more music, starting a new band or going all in with Judah. Not that that's necessarily been presented as an option, but something that I've certainly thought through and talked to people about. If, or I get asked a lot, like, when are you, you know, coming? When are you coming back? And to me, you know, like, I'm I'm back. It's just maybe not what they either think or want for me. And so having to really ask those questions of, I guess another example of what does it look like to be in this thing that can be good for me and for them, hopefully, and for the people that are around us, but how do I also protect what I'm continuing to learn is necessary for me. So getting enough rest, you know, what does my relationship with God look like? How is that going? Am I prioritizing that? Um, Am I able to do my other hobbies that I enjoy um, and live a more kind of happy lifestyle that isn't just so like all in, you know, whether it's the band, whether it's dating, whether it's, you know, mountaineering or whatever other thing that I'm excited about. I really struggle to understand how I can have more than one at a time. So while I was, you know, dating and I was engaged for a while, while I was in the band, like, it's like, well, I've got to quit the band to make this work. It doesn't seem to make sense to be able to sustain a relationship or eventually get married and also have this pace of life with the band. Can I start a new project, like a solo project, side project, and also do Jude and the Lion? Like, that was always a big rub for me, and so I haven't done anything else. You know, can I live in a place different than Nashville and... So that's probably been the most tangible movement forward in something where it's like, okay, I moved, still playing with the band. It's not as full-time as it used to be. I've got more space for other things. But I still feel that constant rub of, like, I should be all in on 
something. And so to not have that is a really difficult place for me to be and and not something that I think is necessarily good or like, you know, one of those things that I feel and I'm like, can people help me <laughs> to discern that, whether it's my therapist or life coach or just friends and whoever's around me and feels like one of those things that people are like, yeah, it's possible. And I'm like, how? <laughs> just still doesn't make sense to me. So it's one of those things that I, you know, it keeps me up at night that I'm still struggling with. It's like, I think I have things much better set up and I'm in a much better space than I probably have ever been, but I still have a really hard time appreciating that and understanding that that can be okay or basically that I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. I'm always in this place of, I think some of that is like missing what it felt like when we started the band of like, it's going to be hard. We're sacrificing a ton, but we're going. It's like, I don't feel like I have anything like that anymore. And I don't know if that's, that's probably more normal and healthy. Because <laughs> it's not to say that like I was a healthy man during that time or uh, I had everything I needed, but um, I think I long for that passion and drive and understanding of purpose and I have a really hard time knowing where to put that intention um so I don't know if I answered that question or not but no, just yeah. it's good it's good I was I was letting you um I didn't want to stop you again Here, here's why here's why and this is what I'm thinking I dude I'm thinking so much about how I was excited to ask you the question about how do you help somebody go all in. And you were saying that it's actually not been a great thing for you. And that actually caught me a little off guard. Because it's a re I've I, I've always said, "Hey, look, it's really about when you see something go all in so that you can see what comes of it, so that you can not live with regret, so that you can see if you know, and, and I think there's an appropriateness for sure when it comes to going in. You took the other side and you were like, yes, but I sacrificed who I was. Or you didn't take care of myself at all. Or, which is what I would say, there's an appropriateness that comes with something that doesn't matter as much as you matter. You matter more than the thing. That's what I hear. <laughs> 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 and and so, uh, man, it's I, I, there's there's something there's something to you've only had one of those. Whoa, this is it experiences. There's something to that. I just want to I want to pick back up right there for a second. Um, and. Here's what I think it, it here's what I think it could be. I think there's other aspects of what it could be, but here's one big one, I think, is that you had a vision of what you wanted to see come into your life. And when you saw the door open, you knew. If I walk through this door, I will see what's on the other side. And I'll be in the room that I've been dreaming about being in. See, uh, the Bible lets us know that without vision, the people perish. And in some ways, I, I understand that practically by saying, if I don't have a vision for this, I can't, and, or this area of my life, or this person, or this thing, then I can't expect to see it go anywhere. And then when the right people come together and the right circumstances come together, I will never know because I have no vision for what that group of people or what that thing would, would or should or could even look like. And the simple fact that you found a skill set that made you stand apart, you knew it because you had vision for what you wanted to do with your life. Not necessarily that you were going to be the get best guitar player in the world. That wasn't a part of the vision, from what I heard you say. Yep. The vision was, I want to be in a band and be a professional musician. 
See, that's different. So you were going to do whatever it took, and you were going to get whatever skill set you needed to see that come into your reality. So flip the script. If, if someone doesn't have vision, what would you encourage them to do to get one? Great question. I, uh, I think maybe people don't have the right idea of what a vision is or what it could be. Thing I'm thinking of right now is like when people tell me they're not creative. I'm like, I just don't think that you th- look at creativity right. <laughs> um, Talk about that. Yeah. How should we look at creativity? Well, I just I think maybe people are too hard on themselves, or if they think like, oh, I don't play music, or I don't draw, or uh, write poems, or whatever. Like, whatever it is that you know people would normally like, oh, that's a creative endeavor. If you're not doing those things, then I think it's easy for people to be like, I don't have that and me you know i don't know what to do i don't think i can do that and i would challenge everyone to be like i think you're creative every day and whether it's the way that you set up your schedule the way that you communicate with someone the way that you build a strategy in your your business um i heard this i i I read this excuse me i don't know if i heard this or read this (laughs) i just have this in my brain right now (laughs) and it's this um uh Ants make colonies, bees make honey, wolves make packs, humans create futures. Hmm. And I think actually the the word was instead of make, it was create. So ants create colonies, bees create honey, wolves create packs, humans create futures. And the, the concept that this person was trying to help others understand was that humans, all humans, whether you want to or not, you're creating the future. Yeah. Because that is what we do. We create what doesn't exist yet, which is what's going to happen in the time that we are going to be given, that we haven't been given yet. Um, I have a friend um, who's in this room right now who constantly lives in the future. And he has to bring himself into the present and what I think about that is I think it's awesome to think about the future but you can't be there but you can't be here and you can create the future from this direction that we're headed so I firmly agree with what you're saying I just wanted to to add that sure so as we see ourselves as creatives how does that help us with vision yeah, I, I think it's just important to realize the fact that you are creating um, really in every situation. Like, yeah. and I think maybe on the end of vision, maybe it's like often we're told like, hey, this is what your vision should be um, and don't give us or ourselves the freedom to go after something that we maybe are excited about. And you hear the stories all the time of like, well, I wanted to be a musician or I wanted to be whatever, but my parents or whoever was like, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or go down this path that will give you security. And So I, I think maybe it's just kind of worked out of us to an extent um, for everyone, whether it's in regard like what I want to do with my life or anything else. It's just letting other people almost make that vision for us, tell us what's going to be best for us and, Obviously, there's a line there of, like, I want to trust and, you know, believe that these people want the best for me and they care. And I, and you've heard me say multiple times of, like, other people helping me. <laughs> but I don't really know if I had many times in my life where people were like, this is what is best for you that I wasn't already kind of. Yeah. I never really had people tell me, no, that's a bad idea in regard to things like this. It's not like I'm out here. I don't know. I don't need to explain this, yeah. but just. So I would say for folks, like, pay attention to what those things are that really make you excited. Mm. Um, Even if it feels crazy or way out there, it's like remembering that hopefully we have time, like we were just talking about what can happen in a year and 10 years and who knows, Um, but also the reality that, like, today is all we have. 
So what does it look like, you know, to take a small step today in that direction of the thing that you're, you're working towards? Um, but also giving yourself the freedom to try. So I don't think there's a lack of vision. I just think there's a lack of like appreciation that it's a worthy vision, um, that it's something that can be invested in. Um, I still struggle. So, like music was always the thing that again made the most sense. I was supported in that way. My parents did it. So I was like, go forth. Mm -hmm. Who knows what it'll look like? But it was a lot easier to have a support system that kind of knew a direction to move in that way. Whereas I feel like there's a lot of things in my life now where I'm like, this would be really cool. I think I would enjoy that. I think I could be good at that, but it feels more open-ended or loose. Like I don't know the steps maybe to take in that direction. Um, so just, it's not that I'm aimless, um, but yeah, trying to find, so like being in the mountains and skiing and doing more of that, moving to a place like this that opens up that door. It doesn't have to be so drastic of going to a Nashville or going to a winter park or somewhere that allows those things to excel, whatever it could be, New York for music, film, Broadway, whatever, whatever it is, any place that kind of can help cultivate your goal. You don't have to do that. It's, you know, I spent, I was in high school, so like I didn't really have an option, you know, but like it wasn't like I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to do anything until I get to Nashville. I would love to go there eventually if that happens, but like what can I do today to help give myself a better opportunity to find those doors that when they might open, I'm more prepared to walk through. So, yeah, I think it would just to summarize that be like everyone probably has more visions and ideas than they realize because they don't pay attention. Uh, but then having people come around you to help you understand if those things are worth paying attention to. And, you know, it's probably very rarely going to be like a stop what you're doing now and go all in on that. It's like, no, what does it look like for you in the midst of your job or school or taking care of your family? Like, how can we integrate? How can you, you know, write a poem a week, draw for 15 minutes a day, rather than like, oh, I need to be doing this. <laughs> All the time, because I've had weeks like that, too, where I have, like, a super productive, you know, probably spent 20 to 40 hours on something that I'm making, but then the next week is like, that was too much, I'm burnt out in the midst of everything else, and then I just stop for a while. So it's like, I think there's something to not going totally all in at the expense of everything else, because that's another example of having too much going on, so it's not sustainable, but, like, what are the little steps that can be taken towards these goals and ideas and visions that come to us? Also, like giving ourselves the pressure or the freedom to fail. <laughs> um, which again, I'm awful at. But going down these roads that excite us and are passionate, and not having the expectation of success and whatever that looks like, or redefining what that can be, so that. And also, it's just okay to have fun. Like one of the things I also really, <laughs> we're just going through it. It's like. Everything I do has to be successful, has to make me enough income, has to garner enough attention. You know, a classic example for me is like people all the time are asking me if I'm making my own music or whatever. I'm like, kind of, but I just, I get stuck at the, like, how does this become a successful business? Not mm. just go make music yeah. for fun. And uh, part of that was, like, with Jude and the Lion, that was a lot of, lot of my role, especially in the early days, of helping foster, like, I feel like Judah, in particular, his strength is a lot. But if I could boil it down to, like, one thing that he was best at was churning out content, music, vision, where we're going. And I feel like I contributed in the same way we all did in different aspects, but, like, my s biggest strength, and I think one of the things that, maybe going through idea of like what is a calling in the midst of whatever not to over spiritualize it but like vocation essentially the idea of no matter what you're involved with whether it's this yeah. Yeah. playing a show being on the road hanging out at a coffee shop whatever it's like everywhere i go everything i do what am i bringing to the table that makes or that is me 
not this idea of like I'm doing this thing and that makes it worthwhile. It's like what do I bring to the table? And so, um, on that particular end, I was talking about like I feel like I help people understand what's, in my opinion, worthy of being cared about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Judah had, you know, these great songs and visions of what he wanted things to look like, and I came alongside him, and I think part of why our partnership, particularly he and I, and Brian was always great at so many things and kind of in between both of us on that end, but it's like kind of talked about, and uh, I'm not trying to be cocky here because who knows how things would have worked out, but I feel like if Judah didn't have me, we would have had a really hard time getting people to care about Judah and the Lion and like to even have Judah and the Lion exist like he had this whole bubble of creativity and I was like this is how we get people to hear and appreciate that and so whatever it is in my life that I'm excited about and believe in I feel like I have a gifting to try and bring people into that like mm-hmm. this is worth paying attention to let me tell you why let me show you that I'm excited and it's yeah. okay if you don't come alongside but I want you to have the opportunity to see what good could come from this thing so I don't exactly know where I'm getting at with that, but I think maybe you can rein me. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. I don't. I don't want to rein you in because I think you're you're saying some amazing things. I, you said five ish, <laughs> like really powerful points on like if someone's looking for vision, uh, what excites you? If someone's looking for vision, uh, surround yourself with people that are excited about that thing and better at the thing bec- than you are. You did that. You've done that every time. You you did that in Nashville. You did that. Uh, you did that here. You're doing that again. You're gonna keep doing that. Like you, you found something that's of really value because it's gonna push you. And I'd say you should probably just. That's like you should you should coin that. You know that's a that's a powerful thing. So what excites you? Who's really good at that thing that in that that excites you? Be in community with them. And then you said, well, what can you do between now and, and being with them all the time or being in the area or being in that industry? What can you do now to get better that they would encourage you to do? And then you said, hey, look, like you've got to put yourself out there to fail. And then you said at the end, you said, then find out how you can be a part of a team. Here's how I was a part of the, the team. Judah was Judah. I was the lion. You know, and and like this is what this is how we work together. Well, that's not being cocky. That's you making yourself valuable because you are. So you made yourself what you already are, which is valuable. Mm -hmm. Those five things are immensely important when it comes to seeing a dream become reality. And that's what you've done. That's exactly what you've done. I want to ask you a question, though. I think this I've never asked this question before in my life. And I disagreed with something you said. Sweet. And I, f- I think it's a, a healthy, like, convo. Why do you ever, excuse me, what if you reframed how you thought about going all in? I, th- I see you already kind of naturally reframing it. How you originally were framing it, correct me if I'm wrong, was I will do everything and forsake everything else if it's not about that thing. What if that's not going all in from my point of view? Do tell. So, if go, it, what's the point of going all in? To see the thing come into your life and never leave your life. What if your version of going all in is seeing the com- thing come into your life and leave your life? I would say that's not going all in because that doesn't that's not the definition that you're I'm seeing that you want to live by. I think what you want to do is you want to create and you want to see these things come in your life and never leave your life. So what if we use that as our definition of going all in? I have it and it never has to leave me. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Okay, so like that's how my brain's thinking just even right now. Is is what if going all in is taking care of what needs to be taken care of so I can keep the thing that is the dream, which is taking care of yourself, 
which is getting the rest you need, which is getting the space to have fun, which is getting the space to have create, which is going scheme, which is having these conversations, which is eating well, which is being here, which is going there, which all of it actually works together to create you. And if you aren't healthy, then you can't have the thing that you want the most, which is to stay in the dream. It's to keep the dream a reality. So it's not that going all in is bad. It's that maybe your framework is just a little off because you thought you had to sacrifice everything to get the thing. But in sacrificing everything, you lose who? Me. The thing that matters thing. most. Yeah. Or whatever. Which is who you are. Yeah. Being you. That excites me for your future. Thank you. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's you you're welcome. That that's the thing that excites me is when I get to sit here in your awesome house in Winter Park and you have these records behind you and you have this vision of what you want to do with your life and you have these banjos that are so sick when you walk in and you've got like people and you've got these things and it's like it's awesome but it's like how can it work all together? Because all of it needs to work together for you to stay in it. And I know this. If you're not in it, we all lose. Which is what I hear your friends saying. When are you going to create your thing? When are you going to uh, uh, When are you gonna maybe come to Nashville more? When are you going to – what's your role with Judah and the Lion? It's, it's confusing to them because they just want you. And in the middle of that, man, I think – there's this business jargon. Oh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. There's this business jargon of mission, vision, and values, which is great. It's, that's business. But I think there's this human jargon of where we have forgotten how to be ourselves naturally, who we were created to be. And I th still think we need mission, vision, and values, but I think we misunderstand that because that's more business. And I think we need DNA because we have to have it to be able to grow and become who we were created to be. And DNA has vision. DNA has a mission. DNA has values. The formula set up so that you can live this life that you created. You still need those things, but you need them organically and naturally. So what does it take to make the plant or the life that is Nate grow? That's, I think, the future of you going all in. I was just getting inspired as you were talking about it, so I had to like share that with you because I'm excited for your future, and I want you to not feel like you have to like press the eject button all the time. And not that you've done that all the time. Don't. Uh, I mean, I mean, you've at least that thought is there. Yeah, or you. I know. I know you haven't pressed it a ton, but you've at least had the idea. We were talking about dramatic earlier, and it's like I don't, I don't remember if that was necessarily something we talked about on here. I was like, I feel that. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I just like, I just need to stop everything and just go do this other thing. And it's like, well, hold on, this thing over here helps me stay in this game over here longer. Is it still a part of the mission to help it all? Am I? Am I? Is this? Does this all help the life that I'm trying to create come into view? And is this, is, is this, ooh, yeah, is this who I want to become? Does this thing help me do that? And before I can ask that question, I have to say, who do I want to become? And then I ask the filtering question of, do these things help me become who I want to become? And not that you need any of that. I just think we all as humans need that on a I regular need basis. Yeah. Um, what are you, so as you had this, like, you had these moments. You had that one moment at the bell tower. Will you describe the feeling for me of, like, seeing the door that is this opportunity? Because you've done a great job of, like, taking opportunities. And maybe that one stood out among the rest, like you were talking about. Maybe you never had that moment before. Can you talk to me about that feeling in that moment, I'd love to like feel that. Yeah, I'll I'll do my best. Um, I think there's maybe one other that kind of goes similarly with it that we can hit on, but I guess 
it helps when you're, you know, looking for something. Mm -hmm. So if I was just thinking like, ah, this is going to be whatever. I'll go play music with these guys that I don't really know. I'm not, I guess what I'm getting at is like, because I had an idea of what I wanted when I saw it, it was easier to recognize. So if I wasn't thinking in my mind, like, Hey, I'm trying to find people to do this with. I probably just would have been like a regular jam session, which was pretty common to have at Belmont, like run into people, just go play music. So I think every time I did that, it was in my head, but, um, so having that kind of recognition of what it felt like to play with other people to mm -hmm. not that any of those were bad, but it just didn't have that same feeling that came with this where it's like, no, this is what feels really good. Mm -hmm. Like those other things could have been great, but like this was clear that there was like in something just to, it wasn't like I saw the world flash before my eyes and I knew exactly, yeah. but I had a vision of what I was hoping for. I was willing to have that be, I guess, molded and malleable. It's like before that year, I wasn't ever imagining that banjo would be, and I was thinking I'd be more of a front man. So like those are examples of things that I had to sort of be like, that doesn't have to be this. Um, so being willing to shift those things. But yeah, just there was a magic that kind of came with playing together, that meshing of those instruments and our play styles just was really beautiful. So it's not that, again, the other times weren't, but this just, I think, had all of the pieces at that time that I was willing to look more at. Um, and it felt worth trying. Mm. So I think of that moment and then um, the night that we were putting out our first EP, I think it was like that summer, six months after we met. Um, I was sitting at a party in my car. Um, so you weren't at I the just, party. Well, you I was. Were, you were seeing a party, <laughs> and you were sitting in your car. I think like I <laughs> hadn't gone in yet because I was so like anxious. Mm, wow. Um, I remember calling my mom, and it essentially was this feeling of like, mom, and kind of what you said earlier, but like, if I, if we do this, we're gonna see it through. It wasn't like a feeling of like oh i hope people like it or because obviously like we didn't have that many fans didn't know what would happen but it was this feeling and i don't think i've ever had this sense truly of like if we do this this will change everything and not necessarily for the world but like it was the most obvious moment i think of we're doing an action and like we'd already done it like it was coming out <laughs> it wasn't like we had the option that night to pull it or whatever and that I didn't want to do that, but it was just like, this will change my life because this is going all in by this finally coming out. Um, so I think that coincides with this thought of belief in what we were doing. Not that we knew what it would become, how successful it would be, uh, how it would affect people truly, but like, I am doing this and I believe in it no matter what. And it was scary because it was like, mm. here, here we go. Like, everything's going to change. I didn't really know what that meant, you know, but I'd already dropped out of college. It was essentially, in my mind, like a declaration of intent. of Like, I will give this everything I have. Um, I didn't talk to the other guys about it. I didn't feel like I needed to. But it was just, for me, this moment of, like, acceptance of the path that we were on and that, like, a gratitude for where we were and what was happening, but also a big fear of I don't know what to compare that to because it feels tacky but like maybe the I've, and I've never been married but like kind of this declaration of like I'm choosing <laughs> sure. that again feels dramatic but th this like intent I am showing up I am giving everything to this and tonight seals that deal without yeah. knowing what will come and um, kind of like a burning of the boats moment point of no return yeah yeah and so I think maybe meeting the guys and playing that first time obviously didn't have that same feeling of like, this is it. Everything's happening now. But it was the first moment of like, I really believe something could come from this. Why? Why did you believe? 
I feel that, by the way, for you. Yeah. I feel that you did. I'm just so curious at why you believe it. <laughs> Sorry if I just skirted around what you no, just asked no, for. No, no, you're good. Um, I don't know what that is. I, I think there was a belief in the character of these guys, even though I didn't know them that well. Um, and maybe... <laughs> Sorry, that's a whole other. But no, the no, idea no, no, of no. like that's I think that's key. You say someone's character and you believe in their character. That is a mountain of evidence. Yeah. That that you may not know all of it, but you're committed because you see it and you feel it. And a lot of times I think very few people find those that have the character that are worth believing in and going all in with. That feels like a team. Yeah. That feels like you choosing to even maybe even be more than a team. But like, now we're adventuring into like, I'm choosing these people to live my life with, to leverage my life for. Sure, it may not change the world, but it changes yours, which yours has to change before you change the world, you know? Your world has to change before you change the world around you. And you have done that. So I think character, that is a linchpin for sure. What else? Just curious if there is anything else. Yeah, I think music is such a big part of it. So I don't know what that balance is really. But it's like I think if I had just shown up and even if we played the same things but I, we didn't get along, yeah. I don't know how much it helped that we went out for lunch beforehand like to kind of have this – like if we just showed up cold and started playing, like I don't remember everything we talked about by any means, but surely there were some things that came up that started to also plant that seed of like maybe they're not looking for the exact same thing as I am or they don't have their priorities lined up like I do. Or Again, it's not that they didn't want to be in a band, but I think at that point I was like this is – and again, like having come off of sort of losing my last guy that I yeah. – wanted to do this with so it wasn't this unfamiliar like maybe for the first time but um certainly just like you know i don't know them that well but i can tell that they're good men want good things um there is this natural connection musically that again i don't really know how to explain that or what to compare it to but just this sort of meshing of like souls that feels bigger than me what i could have imagined and uh but really i think even though it took a little bit to kind of convince them to do more than just that one record again or whatever i think all of us have talked about like that day felt really special like i know judah said he called his mom afterwards like crying like hey this is something you know and i went back to my roommate still one of my best friends and told him how different that jam session felt compared to all the other ones I'd done. And, um, fun hearing him recount that day, obviously, because so much has happened since then. But just him seeing me go out all the time and play with people and whatever and maybe things that I, you know, in hindsight and helping or other people helping us remember certain things. Um, but he also points to that moment of like, yes, this was something special. So I think it's, again, having people around us that, are aware of our goals and what we're looking for and what we need and helping us see like, Hey, that's mm. yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do that. But like we're with you and we know what it's like the rest of the time, not in a bad way yeah. or that things are bad, but just like helping. Cause I think we can get, or I can get so caught up in again, what I think I need to do, what could be possible, whatever. And I need people that are around me to be like, okay, well, how's that different than last week? You know, or we talked a month ago or six months ago or, I've known you for X amount of years and you've, you know, talked about this for years. So, yes, when an opportunity comes, go figure that out. As opposed to, like, you know, no, you've been doing music forever and you've never talked about skiing. So why would you uproot your life? <laughs> like, no, this is a good thing. Stick around for that. And but no, it's like, no, this has also been a big thing. So I think going back to the idea of like, how do we have a more full picture of these different aspects of what make us who we are um, so that when an opportunity comes along, 
you have those people to help guide and help you appreciate and help you remember those big pinnacle moments. And it's those things like I've talked about, you know, December 11th, 2011, so many times that it feels like this magical, mystical day more than it might have actually sure. been, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, like that was the day that we mm-hmm. met and got together. And so it's, or yeah. that call with my mom yeah. or whatever, it's just things over time can either be like, ah, that didn't matter, or no, that really was a big pivotal moment. And so. When you find people, here's what I hear you saying, it's important to find people that you understand and that understand you. And it feels like that is what was happening in that moment is like, whoa, we play like this together because we understand each other and we don't have to say anything. And then when we use words to describe it, I get where they're coming from. And then when they talk about where they're headed, I'm headed that same direction. And it's like, man, just being understood, I think, is so key to us being able to take a step forward with those that are around us. It's like this person's trying to understand me. They do understand me. They are trying to speak the similar language that I'm speaking they are trying to create in a similar way that I'm trying to create. Yes, not the same, but I'm not trying to have a community where everyone does the same thing because that's how we can all add value in each other's lives is to fill in the gaps between the things that we are good at versus what they're good at. And like, man, you're really coloring in like your past with really great clarity. And I want to encourage you, like, as you think about your future, how could you take a, whole, a lot of these principles to do the same thing? And it may not be with the same people. It may be with the same people. It'll probably be a combination of that, you know, who has been and who needs to be and so that you can stay in the, the game of life and create this life that you need to live and want to live. And those don't always line up until we flesh it out. Yeah. Um, where is Nate headed? Because you're doing something right now that is very interesting. And I'd love if you kind of maybe talk about the future of, of Nate. Well, figuring it out. I guess always going to be doing that. Always That's like the been. perfect banjo player answer. Well, figuring it out. Figuring it out. Phew. Um, Yeah, all this, it, I, like, I'm amazed by how pertinent m- talking about 10, 14 years ago feels, you know, uh, to now. And even just thinking about going to tour next week, um, it's beautiful to remember where we came from. So much has happened, um, good and bad and painful and beautiful that it does make it hard to appreciate what we have some of the time. Um, Especially now that it doesn't look like I maybe envisioned or had hoped. Um, And it's not that it's bad or not good enough. It's just, you know, it is a job and it is a gift and it is difficult and it is great and all encompassing. And um, when I'm away from the road, it's not, really so it's just like it went from everything to nothing for a couple of years to what it is now where it's somewhere in the middle and i think again that's probably it's a good going in the it right could direction. be a good framework for yeah. you to work with right still all in yeah like but all in keeps you in <laughs> yeah of trying to out. figure out the <laughs> other parts yeah. of life that allow yeah. me to live an all in life um and being okay with the role that truly I'm grateful to have now is um, just being contracted with the guys. and um, So I'm not doing any of the writing. I'm not in the meetings anymore. I'm not on the business strategy calls or marketing, promo, any of that stuff. Um, just playing the shows. And I think some of me has been sort of trained to be like, this is my favorite part of what we do, but I think there's a reality that I miss other aspects of it but some of those I just didn't feel like I've sometimes talked about how from my vantage point I think we all three came into this being like we need to be the starting quarterback 
But the reality is you can only have one. So we could all be quarterbacks, but we're not going to all play at once. One of us is going to be the guy. Um, and not really appreciating that, like, maybe I was a wide receiver or a coach or, you know, Brian was a tight end or, you know, whatever other position. Essentially just saying, like, how do we appreciate our roles and help each other grow in those things as opposed to expecting, you know. I am creative, as we've talked about, but I don't sit around every day just like, oh, I gotta write songs. Like, give me my pen and paper. I've got to, like, sorry, i got to leave dinner. I've got <laughs> idea. I've got to get down. Like, that's not me. It's I can write, and I do enjoy it, but it's always been more for something, and so my end was more of, again, maybe more of the business analytical. Like, I could sit in a meeting and talk about goals and dreams and action points for hours and good luck getting Judah to sit still for more than an hour. <laughs> he can do it, but like sure, I get not, it, not a great spot know, for <laughs> same same person. I <laughs> get it. Be. Yeah. I so get it. I get it, man. <laughs> and that's okay. But I think like that's a great example where both of us get frustrated in that. Like I remember early points where he was like, mm. Nate, why aren't you in here riding with us? And I'm like, cause I'm booking our tour. Like, can you help me with this? And he's like, don't worry about it. Let's, so, uh, like, there was just this, and not to say we were both wrong to feel those things, but there was always this tension of, like, hey, do more of what I'm doing because I feel isolated, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, like, hey, that's awesome. Yeah. I celebrate you. I'm yeah. not diminished because I'm not yeah. able to or want to do those things as much. And I think where we're at now, although there's history and <laughs> drama and whatever that, again, I think has kind of created the necessity for something like this but it, there's also a reality that like it allows me again to have a more all-in rest of my life where now i can come back and be like i am stoked to go on tour yeah but that's what happens with like really good friends and with people that are family is like there is that like back and forth and you grow and you challenge each other and you're frustrated and that's i think that's the, those are the best relationships if we can keep those those who people who know us for a decade plus yeah. like that's the win it's like oh man i value i know what i hear you saying is like we i have to i have to say like i value you for you and dude i just i love that so much yeah so that's something i'm working on yeah so you're working on the 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 music side yeah and like it could be like this it could be something different and it could be you know you even creating your own stuff, which you definitely should. <laughs> like, we, we need we need like banjo only. Uh, no, whatever. Uh, it would be sick for you to do that as well. Um, like, what what other aspects of your life, like the crazy one <laughs> that you were telling me about the other day? <laughs> if I need to like push you in this direction, uh, what's the what's the what's the craziest hike you're taking people on lately? Let's ask that question. <laughs> Sorry to get so stuck on the music side of things. <laughs> Um, no, it's good. I want to talk about that. I, but I, I, yeah. What you're doing now, though, on this like hiking stuff, is unbelievable. People will be like, "What?" And they need to really connect with you on this. I would love that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm a expedition trek host uh, for Everest Base Camp. So I help put together groups of people and plan and then execute. Uh, on those trips, so I'm in. I would love that. <laughs> now we've talked about that a little bit, but I <laughs> we absolutely want that to become a reality um, if we can. But so yeah, I've gone twice now. Um, planning to go back this coming March, and then you know, God willing, this becomes a continued, sustained part of my life in some form. Whether it's continuing to go back there or doing other trips and expeditions, um, it does feel like one of those places that kind of bring it back to like the idea of calling and vocations. Like who do you bring to the table no matter what situation you're in? And I think more than most things that I can think of, this kind of hits on so many, I want to say all, but so many aspects of what I love about life, who I want to be, who I am. Um, You've getting to got to hit on a few of those. <laughs> what, what, br what brings, what, does going to Everest Base Camp bring out of Nate? First off, it's 
I think the most beautiful place I've ever seen, ever been, certainly. Um, you know, biggest mountains in the world. So that in of itself is super special. But uh, growing up in Colorado, I've always been a person that would choose to be in the mountains if possible. I've always been fascinated by just looking at them. Like, obviously, playing on them is a whole other thing that I love. But um, there's a peace that I feel being nearby or having close proximity to it and so to go to a place that is just I mean it's basically a 40 to 50 mile hike that you do over nine days um you're starting at 9,300 feet and going up to about 18,000 give or take there's a couple little things you can do that are a little higher than that um but it's really cool in particular because you're not really summiting a peak like this trip gets compared a lot to other things like hiking Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, which is the highest peak in Africa. It's like 19,200 feet or something like that. So comparable elevation takes about the same amount of time. But the massive difference is that when you're in Africa, you're just looking at Kilimanjaro. It's like we're going up there. And when you're on the base camp trek, you can't even see Everest when you're starting. Um, it takes like three days before you get your first actual glimpse of it and there are a couple peaks that you summit but they're more just i mean it feels weird to <laughs> you go up a 16,000 and a 18,500 foot peak but it just feels like part of the the process and even those it's crazy because you get up those and you're like well there's another one that's like half a mile from here that's 26,000 feet so this is a like even though i'm looking down a massive you know couple thousand foot drop when you get up there it's still like nah we're like you take a photo and you're like you're not at the top of the mountain there's there's a big one right there so it just doesn't have this feeling of like i'm summiting this thing that is the goal it's more like the journey truly um again it's about nine days and every like two hours you pass a new corner and you're just like there's a new vista of peaks that are all above twenty thousand feet is that one everest is that one ever she's like no that one's only twenty one thousand feet <laughs> I would say only <laughs> just <laughs> using words to minimize what's happening is is very very funny yeah so it, it's just that's the whole thing it feels like it's just like how is this real um i can't even imagine like it, even when you're standing right there it's just mind-boggling to think about where you are what's around you um so that is a massive part of it it's like the beauty the majesty of it all is just in insane um another huge aspect of the trip that i particularly love is the people so obviously you're with a group of folks that you've been talking to for six months to a year trying to plan this thing getting to know each other over zoom but now you're finally out there together so that's your core team and then you've got two guides with you um at the top of the line taking care of us um but different than Again, Kilimanjaro is an example where you're going up and you've got people that are carrying your stuff, but they're setting up your camp every night. And you kind of have this core team, even though it might be a large group of, you know, 40 to 50 people that are making everything happen, even if your group is just like 10 folks. Um, massive difference is that every like half mile you're passing through a village on this trek where there are little hotels and shops and people that live there full time. Um call them tea huts but essentially like a hostel hotel kind of thing so you're staying at these every night where they've got like a common room where you know there'll be maybe 50 people staying at each one every night and you'll be with your group here you got a group across the room from argentina from iraq from china from japan whatever uh can canada I, literally anywhere but like you just sit there and you listen to these conversations you can't understand maybe half of them, but like everyone's smiling, hopefully having a good time doing this thing that we've all invested and dreamed in doing. Um, and then the next night you'll be in a different tea hut with a whole different group of people, but you'll see the folks from your last night out on the trail. And so like you keep running into these people, kind of getting to know them, breaking down some barriers, offering each other snacks or, you know, you'll take a break in the same spot and just kind of start up this conversation that's really amazing. And then you're also getting to know like the local Nepalese people that are taking care of you 
both your guide staff, your porters that are carrying all your bags, the people that are living at and running these tea huts, that they're all serving you your meal every night. Um, it's just so like immersive. It's not, it doesn't feel like this, oh, we're just showing up and we're bringing all of what we have. It feels much more like a, I am a guest here. I'm honored to be here. There's parts of it like where you go to a, a monastery um, that's functioning all the time. It's not like all this just kind of showed up for you. It's like you're on this journey of entering these places that have been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The history and honoring who they are, being open-minded. Um, just feels like there's so much to learn and appreciate, but everyone is so humble and kind. We're all doing this hard thing together and becoming a part of what's already established and learning to appreciate and see that. So all I have to say, it's like I have to remind myself each time and my biggest encouragement, I think, to people that are going is just like go in open-minded. Um, I think it's not as hard as people maybe think it is that's not to minimize the difficulty but i think having like the word everest in front of base camp makes people be like well i can't do that whereas i think it's actually aside from the altitude relatively easy hike there's only a couple hours you know three of the nine days where i'm like dang this is and you're never like actually climbing with gear or anything like that it's all you can walk the whole way but it's just like some stair steeper sections there for a little bit but otherwise a lot of it's pretty gradual um so yeah i think it's more attainable than certainly i realized i was pretty terrified going in which i totally i need to keep remembering that as i'm talking to more people that haven't done it of like how did i feel when i was sitting in Kathmandu before we flew to lukla which is where you actually start the hike like that night before i was terrified but had a really great host that kind of, you know, met me there, encouraged me like, hey, you can do this. If anything goes wrong, we're going to figure it out. But like, you got it. It's going to be great. You're going to be great. And I really do like think I would take that approach and encouraging just about anybody to go for it and try it. Um, it's just been one of the most. I'm so grateful to be able to have other things in my life that I'm like, it's hard to maybe know what the best or most amazing thing I've ever done is, but this is up there. I want to go back as much as I possibly can. Um, I get really excited about continuing to build the relationships with the team that's over there locally. Uh, the company I work with, Beyond Adventures, they started doing trips to Kilimanjaro like 20, 25 years ago. And now they do six to eight trips a year with the same local folks. And the way they talk about those relationships is just really inspiring. And so again, I've been twice now um, but one of the things I get most excited about is coming back alongside those mm -hmm. people, Jibon, Lalit, Dolom, <laughs> my boys, uh, that just are world-class athletes, guides. Um, their hospitality is unrivaled. They're kind. They're intentional, patient, um, and just badass. Like, I think they're genuinely folks I look at, even though we have different beliefs, uh, spiritually, that would be the only like difference really, and that's I I'm thankful to be able to learn from them in the way that they prioritize that part of their life, even though I, you know, believe in something different. But as far as folks I genuinely look up to, I, I can't imagine being in a room with more amazing, beautiful souls that care about things that matter, and are really good at what they do. So I get really pumped about, yeah. and I guess another example of trying to be around people that I think are better, not better than me, but better at, or not even that. I want to be more like them. There it is, yeah. Um, I, I feel that. Yeah. So those are some of the things that make me really excited to continue to be in that space. And I think a lot of our team and people, that are in a similar like host position, they're often like, I want to check off all of the trips I want to do. Sure. I'm not sitting here like I would say no to yeah Patagonia. Yeah, would love that. You're like nah Everest because yeah. of the boys. Yeah, I really do feel like that. Like I get much more excited about you know if they're like Nate, you only get to go to Nepal. Great, that'd be awesome. I'd love to um, end up being an expert in Nepal and taking people through that. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Uh, in the simplest 
way you can say this. What has it done for you personally? It feels like one of those things that people around me are like, hey, pay attention to that. Um, it doesn't feel as clear what that looks like or how that comes to essentially it's that idea like how do I make this something I can do every year or that I can do for the rest of my life how do we get it to be that because it still has this kind of like like for example I was had the opportunity to go next month but I need to go can't I get to go on tour right um, it's not necessarily one is better than the other but like part of that decision was I make money or more money doing this <laughs> than I would by traveling. And so hopefully it's never or not often enough to be like, ah, I've just got to keep doing the music instead forever. Hopefully it can have a balance of what, what this year is where I'll go on tour in October, go to Nepal in March, and then I'll go on tour in April. So it all kind of continues to yeah. be possible. But that rub of, or I guess it's, it's more balanced right now, but I am struggling to feel like that's okay. Um, so I, I've also, you know, I've helped host and lead fishing trips, some other hiking things. Um, I'm not hosting, but have gone on a couple big backcountry ski trips to Alaska. I'm going to one in Japan this January. Um, and that feels like another space where even though I'm not necessarily in a leadership role, I think noticing characteristics of uh, some people that are involved in those things that are calling out like, hey, we see you stepping up in these ways or helping lead people kind of behind the scenes or yeah. asking good questions, helping create a vulnerable, safe space um, for people to come and let their guards down uh, in this potentially dangerous or scary thing that we're doing. Um, so those are all things, again, about me that I feel like I want to bring to the table and these places and trips bring out the opportunity to do that so there have definitely been folks that have come alongside that i trust a lot that are mm. saying hey you need to keep paying attention to those opportunities it's not that you have to say yes to everything but what does it look like to integrate these types of situations into life more so man i'm excited about all those things because i believe that they're going to actually help you create better you know those experiences you navigating all of that is just going to help you create better. I think I'm creating a lot in those. Yes. And so that's a great example. For You're me, creating like in those I'm environments. A hundred percent. So I don't necessarily want to come off of that. Like, Oh, well now I get to go be creative and make music. Right. That was inspired by that. That's great if that happens. But I think what I'm more excited about right now is like, how do I creatively invest in Hosting, more of those opportunities? Yeah. Yes. And being creative in the fishing boat or on the trail or, at the lodge of like what is it what can i learn from you what am i hearing what are things that i can be processing through and then bringing to the table to either encourage question or help us grow together yeah. in those things so that feels like a more natural like execution or bringing to fruition my natural creativity i guess come on i agree not to minimize any but like I think that comes down to the idea of like no matter what I'm doing, where I'm at, these are the things that naturally flow out of me or that I hope for and want to continue to get better at. So even when I'm making music, like I think my favorite parts of touring and making music and being in the band were being in those situations where I got to be real with people. Yep. Do things like this, kind of break down the walls and not just have it be like I never – want to just be the guy on stage that's untouchable like we don't know him right trying to find that line of sharing or not sharing too much but um being someone that's approachable you know not all the time but you know people in my opinion make me out to be a bigger deal than i am or ever should be i'm like my thing's like i'm just nate like sure just a guy being a dude <laughs> that's not to like minimize just a guy being yeah a dude. <laughs> that's hilarious it's not to minimize what has been achieved or the opportunities I've been given, but I don't want to be the guy that is unwelcoming or unapproachable or uh, on any kind of pedestal. Yeah, I yeah. think that that's important to help everyone believe that they're enough. 
they're all things I need to hear more. <laughs> right. But um, for me and that I need to believe in more myself, but um, I want everyone I'm around to feel like they're worthy of being seen and cared for and loved and that they're safe um, and known, which are all the things that I, that we all need. Yeah. Um, that I need to know myself better, but it's fun when I'm in those situations and particularly life giving because it's much easier to be like, yes, I am doing something worthy of my time. Um, as opposed to seasons like this summer where I've been home a lot more and kind of like, it's not that it's been wasteful, but, and we all need to recharge, but there are less noticeable days and moments when like I am living into that person I Mm. want to be and can be. So all that, you know, plays into the do no, more, do more. <laughs> no, it to- uh, no, it totally does. And and I don't think you need to minimize any of the things that you've done because I don't hear you doing that. I hear you maximizing more areas of your life, which makes you stay in it longer. Be full in these areas will helps you be um, useful in others. And, dude, I, I couldn't be more excited about your life. I couldn't be more excited about your future. And I can't wait to go to Everest with you. Sounds like a blast. Please come. And uh, and then I'll get to see you in a month or so in Denver when you guys play there, which would be exciting. October 9th. Come on. The Fillmore. The Fillmore. That would be sick. Um, man, just thank you for your time today. Thank you. I hope this is helpful for uh, someone. So helpful. So it's helpful. It's and helpful for me just to be yeah. able to explore some of these and be encouraged by you. So thank you. No, thank you. I think there's so much ahead of us. And as as we kind of bring this to a close, um, I think it's easiest to you know you in the line obviously follow the, follow that or or to connect with you on Instagram. It's uh I think it's just your name right? Yep at Nate Zerker. At Nate Zerker, and uh, last but not least, what's the one question that we should be asking ourselves, or that we could be asking ourselves, to help us keep growing and moving forward? I'd love for you to ask us before we end yeah i think it's kind of a culmination of what we've been talking about but um i've loved this challenge for me but i I think it's a different way of thinking that a lot of us don't hit on but not looking at what i do and achieve that makes me worthy and who i am but um who is the person or what are the things about me that no matter where we are what we're doing who are around that um, we show up as like, so like it's so in with my story, it's like, well, you know, I wanted to go achieve this thing. I wanted to be a part of this that made my life worth living or that gave me purpose. But no, it was more about the day to day who I am in the midst of that. So I think not giving too much power to getting the goal achieved success getting to the end of the race but more truly just who am I every day in the midst of that where does my meaning and purpose come from I think that makes it easier then to be like I'm gonna you know get around about but uh, so often I'm around people that are like I don't know the right thing to do with my life I don't know if I should move I don't know if I should change my job I don't know if I should go to this school or that school I don't know if I should date this person whatever thing it is and I think that God really what I subscribe to, I'm not saying this is total truth, but I, I think that for my story and what I found is that God is everywhere. <laughs> Whatever decision you make, he will be there. I think it's just more about what am I putting myself in that makes me most able to pay attention. So not trying to be like, oh, when I get married, when I graduate, when I have the dream job, when I make enough money, then... I'll be enough or that I have to get to that right point and there's a wrong option. God doesn't care. I think if you move to Minnesota or Winter Park or Vancouver or wherever else, he'll be there. I think he cares more about us remembering who we are, that he's with us all the time and just wants us to be able to notice him. Mm. So it's not that these goals and ambitions aren't meaningful or worth pursuing. I think a lot of them are God given. Um, But, again, what I need to continue to rein it back into is who am I today, no matter what I achieve, 
Even if I just sit on my couch all day. I am enough. God still loves me. Um, he's with me right now. He's not like, get your ass in there and work, and then I'll be with you. <laughs> get over this habit that, <laughs> uh, you know, you've been dealing with, and then I'll love you. It's like, no, I love you right now. It sucks that you're not paying attention to me maybe as you're doing that thing, but I still love you, and I'm going to be here during and after. Um, so that would be my question and challenge is just what does it look like to appreciate where you are right now? Believe that we are enough for the Lord to love us and give us what we need and live from that space as opposed to I've got to always do more, get more, be more, and then I'll be enough. So let me know if you know how to do that. But that's what I would challenge people, and that's what I'm working on myself. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's a great way for us to to wrap up, man. Grateful for you. You too. Man, I can't wait to see what happens next with you. Thank you for joining us on the Full Advantage podcast today. And uh, keep up with my boy Nate and all that is happening into his life. See you guys later.